Welcome to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Welcome everybody to IEP Radio. This is episode eight. We're going to be doing things a little bit different today. Um, and hopefully we'll trend down the road with uh, future podcasts that are similar. But we're calling these kind of series or, or video casts open mics. Get it? Mic, mic, open mic. And it's really more of a kind of like just a freestyle um, chat amongst professionals, um, uh, kind of like a coffee shop talk where we're uh, talking with um, special guests, which we do have this time, Dr. Eric Dorninger helping us out yet again with this and um, really just talking about some of the real talk, some of the stuff that comes up during um, field assessments uh, in the clinical office. And uh, Eric had sent me an email not too long ago, and he throws all these questions at me. And I'm like, we, we got to do a video cast. Actually, it was his idea on this. And so we took a little bit of time to do some research, get our, our, our head right. And it's kind of going to be different today because, you know, Eric, I think, is going to be doing a lot of the interviewing to me. So I'll do the best I can, no judgment, and uh, see what we can talk about today. I will tell you that the, uh, today's main topics have to do with fads fixes and filters. I know that may still be a little bit broad. So Eric's going to help us by diving into some of those details. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, brother. I like to call it Mike on the mic. There it is. We're going to change it right there. Yeah. And you, you use the word coffee shop and it's, and it's interesting. I'd like to get a little more formal than that and call it conference coffee. I pretend this is me and you maybe at a shoemaker conference where the docs and the indoor environmental professionals get to hang out together and, and, and take a moment and basically download each other's brains because I get questions so much with what's going on in the field. And as you know, God wants me to do biotoxin illness. I've had 41 isolated water damage experiences on my own home and working through those, you know, in the thick of it is really where I learned a lot about building envelopes. And I was mold illiterate, like every single patient that walks through my door. I didn't know squat. We know that the industry is full of squirrely thought and things that are meant to make money and turn over business. And then there's guys like you who are really meant to, in in the famous words of my Austrian father, do it right to feel time. We really, really fix a building. So I just love when when the IEPs and the and the docs can get together um, and get just this kind of light blue blue collar um, grit meets white collar on building. You know, there's very there's journals for building envelopes. There's journals for laminar flow and uh, duct work and how much pressure and how much filtration you need to to clean air. And I don't think people realize how intense of an academic science uh, home building and, and, and construction is and subsequently what we need to, to, to build a home. Right. Hanging out with you guys, I'm like, oh, you have tons of journals too. I remember when you were showing me that journal on how to build a proper wall and it just blew my mind. So yes, the tables will turn and we will get on the mic. Some hot seat time right now. We do. And, and as you know, I celebrate you guys and you guys blush a little bit, but I mean it every time. And, and, and remember we had that big luncheon with Ecotrek where we wanted every single mitigator in the room to understand without them doing their job right, my patient doesn't get better. Right. To, with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, secondary to water damage building, which is epidemic. It is a wildly raging underdiagnosed uh, illness. You will not get better. The shoemaker protocol is limited until that first step, the base of the pyramid is corrected. You need to get that building clean. Yeah, absolutely. And even beyond uh, the great work and methodology, which I'm a big fan of with the uh, shoemaker, it's, it's everybody else too. It's the people that fit the Lyme model, uh, mast cell activation syndrome. I mean, really a lot of chronic illness, the theme of these uh, Q&A kind of firing and seeing what I have to offer. It, it's not like we have some sort of um, a cheat sheet here that says, well, if you had Lyme, we wouldn't really, really be worried about your air filtration in the home. So it's really holistic. And that may be actually a, a bit of comfort for you, those of you watching and listening to know that we're, we're not trying to be impossible with any solutions or identifying ways to improve the environment. We're being pragmatic, but you know, we're trying to grab that low hanging fruit and identify things that are working, things that, were, that are not working, things that we have questions and concerns about, and also trying to navigate that big word called budget and making realistic solutions. And I, and I think you trigger a couple of things for me. The first is there are 
true shenanigans out there, true people uh, who, who need to check themselves before they wreck themselves because in the integrity of their soul, they are intentionally ripping people off. Sure. And then you have, and that's, and, and that's a certain percentage of what we see in the IEP and mitigation field. Then you have any field, any field right? And, and I've heard uh, one patient called this the 5% dominance rule where 5% of any profession is truly an expert and knows what they're doing, whether it's your accountant or whether it's your plumber, whether it's your lawyer, whether it's your doctor. And, you know, I've dedicated myself to try and be, become one of those five percenters in regards to CIRS. And, it, and it's, it's, it's thousands of hours behind the scenes to get there. Yeah. It, so um, fatigue makes cowards of men and women. And if you're not willing to, to grind it out, you're not going to become uh, to expert status. And even once you're there, I think there are people who aren't intentionally ripping off our patients. I think they think they're doing the right thing, but we have the data points, the C4A, the MMP9s, the TGF betas to say, whatever you did on your home, uh, it didn't fix it. And, and for me, I think that you were talking about gray area early, earlier uh, before we, we got on, on, on the air here where there's still more gray area problems we're trying to solve than black and white answers we have for what is the quickest, most valuable, financially effective way to, to clean homes. Hence the fads, fixes, and filters. Right on. And one more thing in regards to the MCS and, and Lyme. And it's really important for our listeners to understand. I'll, I'll self-disclose an issue. So I have herpes simplex virus one. I've had cold sores since four years old. And when I was living in my water damaged building as a dreaded gene um, CRS patients secondary to water damage building, I got cold sores all the time. And it <clears throat> drove more this point where herpes simplex virus is an opportunist. It's looking for a confused and weakened immune system to be able to replicate and take over my body again. Most of us have these herpes family viruses, whether it's Epstein-Barr virus or varicella coming out as shingles or chicken pox or herpes simplex one or two and um, Lyme MCS, if you are truly diagnosed um, with, the, with the specific criteria for those disease processes and you have CIRS, water damage building, you have a really hard time finishing those other disease processes, getting that mast cell to stabilize, being able to truly kill and mop up Lyme and subsequently Lyme toxin if you're in water damage building. Because the chronic inflammation leads to immune confusion, which leads to eventually white blood cell count goes down and, and, and you don't have a functional organized immune system anymore. So then you're asking the antibiotic to do all the heavy lifting in line, or you're asking your mast cell to stay stable when mildly triggering foods historically, if you didn't have SIRS, water damage building as an underlying diagnosis, are going to go and, and so on and so forth. So... Again, I can't tell you how difficult it is if you're SERS WDB and SERS Lyme or SERS WDB and MCS to deal with the latter if the former isn't happening. If you're right. in a building. And you, lead, and you lead that back to, yeah, right, exactly. That's the built environment, whether it's the home, it's the office, wherever you're going to, yeah. being pragmatic about addressing that first because you're right, we have the metrics, we have the data, but it's also not a perfect science. I'll just touch on the one point you meant had to do with ethics and morals. Um, it, it's, such a, it's such a dilemma, right? Because um, we want to do what's best for you, uh, those people that are out there uh, learning, and, but it's, it's tip of the spear. There is definitely stuff that we know a lot of, but yeah. it's, not, it's not something so simple as all you needed to take was a couple bit of Advil and you're fine. This is much more complicated and the home's no different. In fact, I've, I keep on hearing doctors and I don't know if they're just trying to um, you know, give us a pat on the back or whatnot, how they say it feels like the, the process of an IEPs or his role or his or hers roles is more complicated because of the nature of a home to just constantly change. Whereas at least with uh, the body and uh, its function, there's certain things that you can tell by testing small amounts of the body that you know are going to be uh, holistic in the body. It's going to be the whole thing, or it's going to be an organ, or it's going to be something. And the home is constantly changing. It's like a moving target uh, that requires a different solution depending on that situation. And so um, yeah. you're right. I think it's root. This is, if it's not the cause or the trigger, 
Uh, yeah. It's certainly something we still need to look about because no matter what you read, no matter what study you're looking at, it's not like anyone saying water damaged buildings are the place to hang out. Yeah. Well, and again, I think uh, to give you that pat on the back, you are the most important step. The diagnosis you do on a home and the treatment plan you, you set forth for a mitigation company to, to accomplish and, and some of the do, do it yourself techniques that homeowners can do themselves. It doesn't happen. Everything we do downstream fails. And when we're working through the shoemaker protocol, I tell patients, you know, if we could get them into clean dorms, uh, if there's a billionaire out there who, who is interested in this, we are going to write a business plan to have 10 clean dorms where we'd like a financier to sponsor uh, the real estate for 10 clean dorms. And for patients who are so um, poor off, they're in Section 8 housing or they're not holding a job anymore, just come and move to that dorm. We'll do our diagnosis, we'll run the Shoemaker Protocol, and we will see that it truly takes three to six months if we can control living environment for the Shoemaker Protocol to get finished. That discussions come, and that discussion comes up all the time with what we do. You're right. It's a, it's mainly an issue of money and having the ability the ability to monitor it the right way. Yeah. Half the half the half of the ideas and thoughts that have come from different industry to build a quote you might say a clean or safe home is yeah. fraught with limitations in that um, either they're not looking at the house holistically. They understand you should keep it dry, but they're using building materials that are off gassing to. Um, not being able to monitor the home. The home is no different than, than the body and that it's a living, breathing organism. And it requires that monitoring because as it relates to you, I know you've brought it up a few times, the Shoemaker Protocol, lit, being able to, to occupy a space that is quote unquote safe enough is critical. Critical. Yeah. And let me put it in other words, the Shoemaker Protocol has never failed when the patient's in clean building and we had an accurate diagnosis of CRSWDB. Sure. And I don't think anybody would necessarily argue that, you know, it, this is the good thing about this podcast is that it, it you know, um, there are a lot of uh, pioneers out there who have set the stage, who've set the framework. And again, going back to a point I made earlier, whether or not you're working with a shoemaker certified physician or somebody who practices it, uh, whether or not you're working with somebody who takes pieces of that protocol uh, and has their own method, or there's another organization you're working with, or there's other beautiful organizations out there like ICI. Um, the point is, is that you won't hear any disagreement about yeah. the home being an issue. Yeah. And so then, and, and no matter what industry, no matter what clinician you're working with, yeah. the topics that uh, Eric's going to fire at me, uh, are, it's the same topics. It doesn't matter who you're yeah. talking with. Now, what I would argue on that is some docs who are certified with shoemakers are, are cherry picking the protocol themselves. Well, yeah, this is no, this is no, this is no different than sabotaging uh, an assessment for environmental professionals. Again, no one's going to argue that. I'm not here to step on toes. I'm here to save time and money in our, in our patients. They sure. are beaten down and we don't have any time or cash to waste. You got to do it right. You got to do it right the first time. The other thing I would say is same thing with buildings because docs don't want to put their foot down and say, this hurts me still looks a little funky. This report I got from uh, Michael Schrantz still looks unfinished. He laid out this treatment plan. Now again, we have all the compassion and we can put on our social worker hat and our financial planner hat. But again, uh, day one is we have clean buildings and that's when we expect everything to go up to protocol. Right. Right? So, so we're just realistic. We never kick anyone out of our clinic unless they get weird or aggressive on our staff with a SERS brain has happened twice in six years. Um, but what we will do is we'll say, look, my hand's kind of tied. So why don't you go out and do a Kickstarter or whatever the frig or, or, or make friends with Oprah and, and get um, a, a finish date for the project. And some of our patients are truly indigent and I understand that. Others have $300,000 in equity and they can pull a home equity line of credit to do an $80,000 fix. That's what I did. We had one of the craziest homes on the planet. We did um, a home equity line of credit of $100,000. Um, my father-in-law kicked down 10 grand, my, my, my own dad 10 grand. We didn't ask him for that money. My dad's a retired butcher. He doesn't have uh, endless cash. He just um, saw what we were going through and that's just the guy who'd give me his left kidney. Um, and then, and then um, we came up with the rest of the cash as we went. We are the top five worst homes of hundreds of homes we fix. It's rare, it's rare to, to, 
to get that extreme on the cash you need. But when you have 41 isolated water damage experiences in one house, you rip stuff out. And if you're truly following water damage to 12 to 24 inches, cutting it out like a cancer, it's, it, it just didn't stop. And yeah. we just had to have fun. And, and thank goodness we're in Boulder and I bought a home at a time and, and, and put some sweat equity into it, put on my tool belt and fixing things up. Whereas the years went on, we were able to pull 100,000 in, in home equity line credit. And my, my little guy, my double dreaded gene with his joint pain and his headaches and his tummy pain, clean building, cholestyramine, gone, yeah. gone, gone, all symptoms gone. And the kids are the funnest because they don't have all these layers of BS and trauma and damage and keg parties and all the other uh, things that, you know, birth control pills and, and weekend warrior non anti-inflammatories and, 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 and racks and racks of antibiotics on their gut biome. They don't have all these layers. So you, you diagnose them young, you get them in clean building, get them in cold styramine, boom, whoa, do you see how quickly things work when in naturopathic law, you've removed the obstacle to healing. Right. So why we wanted to do fads, fixes, and filters, and you and I were batting around some names, is you and I, you know we're soul brothers on this. We, ah, when, when we wasted 40 grand, uh, a patient comes in and 40K went away from doctor hopping or 40K went away from doing uh, a dry fog before doing uh, a rip out, so on and so forth. You just go, oh, and now you and I are in the position with the patient where now there's no money. Right. We, right. we spent Uncle Frank's donation. We spent, you know, my dad gave 20 K. We spent, you know, my husband makes uh, a quarter million a year, but he already did a hundred thousand dollars to this and he wants a boat. He doesn't want to fix uh, mold and, and whatever the story is right. uh, as people finally trickle into a real diagnosis and get working with real qualified indoor environmental professionals. It, it can be um, financially, uh, disruptive. Some of the cash was there to do it right the first time. And well, is it any wonder? Why, is it any wonder why these people are throwing their hands up in the air and not uh, not following through? That's a hard hit. Not everybody has that kind of money. Right. And I have two goals on this. My my first goal, and if we can't get a financier, it's in my business plan. Right now, we're doing college funds. Still need occasional vacation, and we hired an MA to improve patient care. Uh, we hired a, a, a nutritionist who's also helping with some of our educational outreach. We wanna start doing more group style visits to save money in regards to things we explain over and over again. I'm trying to do um, the, the video casts with you so people can come here as a resource and, and, and start to, to get it in, in a way that they don't have to pay our hourly to, to get the basics. But, but, but our goal is at 10 to 15 years out, if, if we can't get someone to help, we'll at least have a small home um, where out-of-state patients can stay um, for a nominal fee or, or maybe even pro bono. Just why, does that, why does that feeling of it takes a village just really be out? Why it's applicable to the highest degree right now. It, it is. And even if we did this, even if they came and stayed for three to six months, got completely better, right? And their husband or their wife or their sister or their friends got to see them. The lazy, I'm lazy, I'm crazy all went away. They believe us that it was just chemistry physiology because they feel 100% again, just like the sequential activation of innate immune elements trial showed us, right? How Shoemaker had to prove for court the treatment uh, works. You're moving from the building, you treat them, everything normalizes, they're healthy again. At least they'll have that reference point. So when they move back to that home and they get sick all over again, they'll say, okay, now we're going to go find the money or we're going to, I love the talk you and Larry Schwartz gave on to move or not to move, right? By the time you involve real estate fees and moving fees and disruption of that, could you have the cash to just fix, you know, a $15,000, um, uh, what am I thinking of the, uh, uh crawl space, yeah. right? Well, Larry, it was Larry who actually, and hit to his credit in Irvine, that did a great job on that particular topic. But to your point, that's the issue is that we're chasing something that's chronic. It's not necessarily immediate. Sure, sure there are people who are symptomatic, like you, they walk right into an environment. There's something that they can feel. But for, for a lot of folks, it's, it's more subtle. It's more gray. Yeah. Uh, or, or even um, they're high functioning and they don't know us that their body's like attacking itself or there's other issues going on. And it's hard to say, yeah, oh, okay, $40,000, sure, I'll sign up for that, when it's nothing immediate. You know, you spend $40,000, you get a brand new car, you, you see what you're getting. 
um, you get in a car accident, heaven forbid you break your leg, you know, okay, it's going to cost $10,000 or what more to fix my leg. You, 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 not that you want to spend that money, but you appreciate it. Trying to fix things that you predominantly can't see mm. is very frustrating for many people. So this is great. What we're doing is to kind of give them that real talk. And, and honestly, uh, it's a great point, especially when a spouse um, has already supported the healing of that chronically ill person and gotten nowhere. They, they've dug that hole of, of keeping faith even deeper. Right. You know, I want to right. crank up Bon Jovi, keep the faith and just say, look, man, we, we got uh, answers for you, but sometimes you don't like the solution. That's right. The, the grind, the solution can be costly, but it's the grind. That's the word. It's the, it's the grind that people yeah. hate. I literally tell them this is a Daniel Cormier, the famous UFC fighter line when I'm working with, uh, with, um, uh, he was also Olympic wrestler for the States. And, and I literally have to tell some patients sometimes embrace the grind. We have the answer, but like, like a Olympic wrestler in the wrestling room, who's not in the mood to go to practice and they go anyway, and they get their ass kicked, and they're getting sweaty, and 220-pound men are trying to dominate them, and they have to keep fighting. You have to keep fighting, but you want good leadership on that fight. You want clarity on that fight. You want as much documentation through that gray area. And the last thing I'll, I'll touch on is, is I think um, this sicker, quicker phenomenon, I'm challenging this. I'm really challenging this. Personally, I don't get sicker quicker after being sick as hell. I can post my labs. I had a, a, an MMP9 over a thousand. You know, my, my, my kids had some of the worst SERS labs I've ever pulled on children. And uh, I think, you know, Icy is doing, having the, the woman on DNRS talk. Um, Penny Hopper. We, we uh, load some of the Wim Hof breathing techniques. Um, some of the um, longevity diet stuff by Walter Longo with resetting genes through um, water fast and fast mimicking diets. I think we can pad the Shoemaker protocol in some of these um, innate immune inflammatory responses. And then again, we have to teach patients. I'm going to teach in um, uh, Burlingham, California, right outside San Francisco, functional endocrinology for, for docs this weekend. I start taking my cholestyramine or well call three days before the trip for the entire weekend, just in case the four star hotel is mole bomb, right? And then I'll continue my well call, my cholestyramine three days at least after the trip. If I, if I got a hit and I don't feel well, I go up to 14 days. If I'm not feeling good at 14 days, I'm pulling blood, right? So, so the Dorninger tribe, we went to creation all over Europe. Um, for three weeks from my dad's 80th birthday two summers ago, everyone were in this rental car and everyone's taking the roll call tablets uh, as we're driving to the next town. You know, it just it's goes. Proactive. Yeah, it just goes with a snack for sure. So, so I, I think um, some of the power we can offer on these video casts is you're getting a little psyched out on this. There's ways to reset this. And again, number one in my personal experience is Shoemaker Protocol is proven, it's documented. If you follow steps, it has never failed. Not once doesn't work. When it doesn't work, we have something to point to. You still have more comes positive. We still don't like that hurts me. Um, you didn't hit your cholestyramine doses. That can be because we're trying to figure out how you tolerate cholestyramine. You know, it would embrace the grind, right? But when they're done, um, things like the genie, things like DNRS, things like um, uh, Wim Hof breathing method, things like um, getting them back into the, the exercise ramp up, getting their power back, right? Uh, not feeling so psyched out all the time about sick or quicker phenomenon. I, I, don't, I don't have it. Uh, and a lot of my patients don't when we work them through the confidence um, that we have from the data and their numbers. And again, clean buildings, and and this is totally anecdotal, we get them in a clean place for about three to six months. So after you go through the protocol, what we're noticing is, is don't go off to Hawaii and stay in a moldy condo to celebrate, I am SERS free. Right. Just really lay low in your healthy air places for six months. Let those genes uh, chill out, don't poke the bear. Just right. put it in neutral, you know. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a, it's a struggle, but you're, you're hitting, you're hitting on key points that we talk about, uh, multiple times, typically a day with clients about, um, the point I took from that last was you got to be careful not to over mentally, you know, um, sell or buy into something that may not be so true. You may have a person's bad experience and they share it and you learn about it. Um, and, and we can use that to segue into some of the fads that we also hear about, yeah. um, get, get, uh, the healthy home quicker, ficker, uh, you know, for less money. And we run into a lot of challenges with that. Uh, one yeah. of the issues of I course, want is the quicker, sicker to be, yeah, sick workout across it. Yeah. Right. Right. The mountains. Or how about I'm healthy enough? How about I'm healthy enough? My first wife made like real love for the first time in three years. Yeah. Now everybody woke up. Concert. Uh, Yes, I went and watched the Nuggets beat the Spurs and was able to stay out till 11 p.m. and wasn't like the Pepsi Center is freaking me out. Right. So, so this is the, the possibilities. And then with Jeannie, you know, in regards to fads, fixes, and filters. Oh my gosh. For that 5 to 10% of SERS patients that have, uh, we think, finished the protocol and, and something's missing, Genie is figuring it out. We had a couple cases with Dr. Shoemaker this last couple weeks. This is next level stuff, folks. I mean, this is giving me confidence with a 12 and a 10-year-old with, with SERS genes that we don't got nothing to worry about. Uh, their experience as a 20-year-old, their experience as a 30, 40, 50-year-old is going to get cleaner and cleaner. The treatments are only gonna get better. And uh, transcriptomics, uh, really being able to see the expression. We had a patient on Monday, and then I'll go on to, the, um, to, to, to my first question here, but he's doing well on THC CBD, and, and uh, he, uh, we can see one of the genes that CBD, the non-psychoactive cannabinoid, turns off. And we see that that part of pain, uh, when he started CBD, he got about a third, about 30 to 50% reduction in his pain. And it's the CBD is addressing that part of his genie, right? We saw- so you're, in the, you're in the right state for this, aren't you? We, well, we are, but I mean, CBD is just a novel anti-inflammatory. Think of yeah. it as turmeric and fish oil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 uh, the other thing we could see on him is every part of the protocol that's supposed to work, worked. The genes that VIP dampen were totally normalized in him. So this is what Genie's giving you the power to do. It's like having a phone line to God and being like, what's left on Jimmy's case, right? It's really the next level. I get now, it. You're asking this IEPs to come up with a Genie for the home. And you know what? That's well, a lot of pressure. Yeah, that's really what I, I would love you guys. And we'll talk maybe on another video cast about, we're really asking you to be Superman with x-ray vision. And it's, and it's uh, a task that's really not cool. I mean, it's, 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 and, and, and then you guys like, God forbid you miss something, right? Because, you know, we love Ecotrek. They're dedicated to the mission. I have no financial relationship with them. They just do the job right. And you might've said, Hey, I want you guys, this is where the water damage is. And once they start popping things open, the trail might go further. Right. And, and someone might say, you know, why didn't Mike tell us about that? And that happens. What? One out of 10 times, one out of 20 times. That would be nice. And you well, may, maybe on a bad day, right? And a good day, you're, you're, you're hitting them out of the park. But we're asking to have x-ray vision. So in regards to these fads, one that just came up, um, and, and it, we can call it uh, fad or fact, you know, okay. um, is uh, someone said, I had a dirty hurts me. It hurts me at 12. One, one awful, but no one's going to get better uh, in there. And... Um, and they, uh, they said, no problem. We did some dry fogging. We're good. So the issue is, what's up with this dry fogging? Um, is it something that people can start leaning on as a solution? Yeah, and I know there's multiple companies doing it. I'm not here to pick on anyone's toes. I'm here no. to save time and money for the patient. No, no, let's, let's see if I can throw out a few, a few things about it without naming names. Um, let's talk about the technology first, right? You're right. There's different uh, companies that offer uh, typically dry fogging. If, if you do your research and look it up, you can learn that the difference between like what's dry fog uh, versus like a wet fog is that dry fog is usually of a smaller uh, particle size, uh, something that you can't really see. Whereas wet fogging, it may be like 30 microns or larger. It's wet. You can see it. You see surfaces getting wet, condensation occurring, things like that. But 
the the uh, if you go online and you read about fogging, what the common theme is for many of the companies is that they are fogging to kill. That's the mm -hmm. sell point. Uh, the theory is uh, we've seen some companies say no remediation needed. So you could literally have a wall that's experienced a damp condition, have microbial growth in there. Let's just make up a number that's reasonable. Let's say five square feet of visible mold growth. And instead of spending the thousand, perceivably thousands of dollars to do a more traditional remediation where you're setting up the containment, using the engineering controls like negative air pressure and proper entry and exit controls, that you'd skip that step and you just cut it, it cutting, cutting the cancer out in a proper operating room. right you could say that they're saying we don't need to cut the, the quote unquote cancer out because we can fog it and with these really small you know micron sized particles this fog in high concentration that it can get into the interstitial spaces and that's true it it, it, it will there are plenty of pathways in your home even the outlet uh on your wall or the light switch or or even more the bottom of your uh, drywall hits the floor. It's not always hermetically sealed. There's a gap. And like anything else, they're, re they're relying on diffusion or the ability for a particle that's um, being bombarded by nearby gas molecules and, and it's constantly wanting to move and it's going to go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So in plain English, when you fog this stuff, it's going to migrate to areas where that fog is not as concentrated and hence you have your interstitial spaces. What? But here's the problem. You're not removing the cancer. You're arguing that you're killing it. And there's a couple topical issues right off the bat, which is um, killing it, according to everything we know about inflammatory response, does not solve the problem for a lot of people, especially those in the house of CIRS and, and arguably for other uh, illnesses. It's about physical removal from this hostile constituent that can cause inflammation in your body regardless of if it's viable, regardless of if it can grow on a Petri dish or not. So mm -hmm. every model that we know of, uh, even some of the more widely recognized, this is the um, IICRC S520. It's a voluntary mold remediation standard, uh, widely accepted throughout the country. Uh, insurance companies recognize it. Even they don't recommend fogging because that we understand that there's too much risk. And I think that may be where we dive in a little bit more with mm -hmm. leaving that cancer and killing it when killing it doesn't solve the problem removing it does i'm sure you got some follow-ups for me well it's just uh that brings up a conference again we call it you call the coffee coffee shop talk and i'm calling it conference coffee where pff, my mind got blown as a doctor serves i think it was 2016 in arizona um where i really understood it's removal and right. it and and I, I think my follow-up on that is you get a similar question with water damage that's now that's now dry. It's dry rot. Uh, okay. Right? And 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 people will say, well, that piece of wood is dried out. So if you see dry microbial growth, uh -huh. you don't have to worry about it. Right. Or you know? well, maybe the theme is is it's not growing anymore. Uh, you could say it's dormant. What's the concern? Right. Which well, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm putting this into two categories. Kill it, which uh, is it still active from in regards to setting off uh, genetic expression of innate immune, uh, inflammatory responses. Do, you, do your genes still get triggered to pump out inflammation, keep you sick, kill it, or remove it? You know, yeah. and, and, and maybe if you're, if you're having dry fog as part of the thing, the removal process still needs to... And let's agree on one thing, and maybe this would help us with the pivot point, which is if you are of the agreement from a clinical side that dead or alive, uh, a contaminant, let's just pick on mold to keep it, you know, keep it 101 right now. Well, let's uh, explain that just for the audience, uh, or, or I can give you my quick one. Water damage, uh, Shoemaker's book, Surviving Mold, technically should have been surviving water damage building microbial growth right especially with the research there's other things but, more than that's mold. not we're, we're using mold a little bit as a metaphor to represent a surrogate we're using it as a surrogate i mean we're not testing the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of molds that may be very well present in a local yeah. environment yeah we're using them as criteria but yeah. on the so on the topic of mold because there's other things to worry about bacteria is a big one too in certain situations yeah. you have to agree because it's a pivot point that dead or alive, it can still create an inflammatory response. And, and arguably what you can, you infer from the research that comes out of these medical communities are like, yeah, dead or alive, it can still cause an inflammatory response. And so 
killing it doesn't prevent you from having an exposure. And for those of you people that are using like a dust sample for a, a mess of, of effectiveness, you have to ask the details. Well, did they fog and then they still wipe down your surfaces? Is it possible that the fogging wasn't the saving grace there? It was the cloth they used to physically remove the fragments that were in your environment that you picked up and sampled and that you think in your brain that it had everything to do with the miracle fog. But what really happened if you're or if or if if someone's talking about this stuff works great, they tested it for mold before and after and the counts went down. How do they test it? Do they do a Petri dish testing where they're looking for viability? Because I would argue if you spray a bunch of poison in your environment that has the ability to kill or make dormant mold fragments or structures, um, spores that can grow that um, you're going to probably reduce that ability for something to grow on a Petri dish. But that doesn't mean you don't still have the contaminants from that same space, that same wall underneath that same kitchen sink, et cetera, et cetera, in the environment. It's a lucrative, it's an attractive option because to the layman, they're looking at the website with all of the, the buzzwords and the, and the marketing um, is save thousands of dollars. Just let us come in here for a few hours and poison the environment. And, and think about it. Doesn't that beg the question if it's, if it's harsh enough to you know, kill a mole, make it non-dormant. What if potential effects could it have on you short-term, long-term? I mean, do yeah. we, are there studies that talk about the products that they're using? But even, yeah. if the, even if the conclusion from that study is it's harmless, it's harmless after two, we proved it, that after three days, you can lick the surfaces and you won't have any effect from this fogging agent. You still have the question of you didn't physically remove the cancer. Right. It's, it's challenging. I think source removal is, is, is always going to be the go-to. And, and this is the same topic, whether we're talking about fogging. Now, there's other fogging, just in, to, 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 to a couple companies' credits, there's other fogging that's used not to get into interstitial spaces. It's right. fogging to drop particles out of the air. Yeah. Um, uh, I promised I wouldn't mention names, so I'm not going to. But if, for those of you who pay attention and know anything, you'll probably know the, the product I'm talking about. But it's more of a wet fog application, and, and it's designed not to kill. It's designed to drop particles out of the air. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you're scrubbing the air, you're still wiping the surfaces. Yeah. You're, still doing, you're still remediating uh, yeah. the areas uh, first, and then you're cleaning. You're not just fogging. Well, to keep you um, in the safe and narrow, I'm the doctor of the IAP. I can mention Greg Weatherman was a lot of the guy, a lot, a lot who pioneered what we call fine particle clean. And that has been a necessary step for some of our patients after they've had the cancer cut out of their wall. And even though you do things under negative pressure uh, properly, it's still a dandelion effect. And when you're ripping out that moldy wall, this is going on. And for some of our patients, uh, their books and everything has been exposed to that uh, for many years. And we have to do a fine particle clean, as you're suggesting, this fog that drops or settles all these particles out of the air. And then you literally vacuum and wipe everything up. And now we have a home that won't test uh, positive or hot uh, on the Hurts Me. And well, and one, of the, and one of the things that was important in, in, in that narrative is that you said that they removed, we're using this term, you remove the cancer. Um, you remove the cancer. And, and a lot of people, it is a struggle because it's hard for a lot of people to recognize this is a building science thing. This is like, the, for those of you listening that are going, wait, it's in a wall. I mean, how can it communicate? Uh, there are plenty of stories uh, publications, articles that show that homes are leaky. I mean, I, 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 when we get into other topics here, uh, I'll likely bring up a few examples where things can communicate. You can understand that it's not just a, a topic anymore about mold spores when we're talking about mold. You can argue that depending on the study you read, there's anywhere from 10 to one study says a million, but you're kind of in the 300 to 500 fragments exist mm. per spore there are arguably way more fragments and these small these fragments certainly can range in in size but s certainly small enough to get into the interstitial spaces we're not trying to freak out because you spilled a glass of water in the corner and you dried it up real quick we're talking about something that may have been more substantial maybe it was a plumbing leak maybe it was a, a toilet overflow maybe it is a chronic issue in your crawl space creating a kind of a low cons a, a relatively uh, lower end of damp condition, but over months and years, it's still conducive for microbial growth. And eventually, uh, the, the, the contaminant itself or byproducts from it that are lightweight and can make their way from those spaces get into your living spaces. It's not one little area. It's the, t the total 
uh, uh, summation of the soup that you're being exposed to, which is why it's so critical to remove. What's more important for those of you who are raising your hands real high, it's to understand that that doesn't mean we're blind to your situation. We may yeah. talk a little bit more about like, what do you do when you don't have the money? Fine, Mike, we yeah. agree with you. We'd like right. to cut it out, but it's $20,000. I got $2,000 to work with. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be fixes and, and band-aids that uh, still acknowledge you still need to cut it out. But as you're doing your personal fundraising, again, our, our uh, mold mitigation remodel was really a two year process. And, and most of the mitigation was six months, yeah. I'm literally saving money to reconstruct the, the building. But I'll share a story uh, in regards to dry fogging, a personal story to me, we use the company um, that BioBalance that that um, is suggested non-toxic. And uh, this is when I was mold illiterate, and it was my first year um, working through SIRS, and I had a lot of charlatans advising. And uh, I'm not saying BioBalance is a bad product, and there might be an implication for it. Um, however, what we did is we put out gravity plates and what you do with a gravity plate is you, is you put it out uh, for an hour and then you cover it and then you send it to um, a company like Immunolytics or something like that and they will look at spore growth. And I had massive spore growth uh, on that gravity plate. Again, this is the infancy of my mold literacy. Then I fogged, then the next day I did a gravity plate and there was absolutely no spores on the plate. And simple science brain says, wow, this is incredible. You can just fog. Uh, later, we realized the wall right next to where I did the spores, um, our, our gutter had failed, and not our gutter, our flashing on our chimney during the 2013 Boulder flood, 16 inches of rain in one week. That's, that's the annual rainfall for Boulder in one week. And our entire north wall had little fuzzy sweaters of mold growing behind the wall, right? So this plate was telling me we're safe, but all it did is, as you suggest, is it dropped uh, spore growth in the air at that moment, and it might last for a week, it might last for two weeks and keeping that air a little bit better. But even those dead spores are probably still getting us sick. Right, well, and, that, and so that's the issue. And it's just so when we go into the other topics, like I know some companies are, are even online, you can find them like ozone bombing, um, that sort of thing. It's the same issue. I mean, ozone's a little bit more uh, understood in terms of potential concerns here. I'm trying to switch to my screen uh, to share with you. We know a little bit about ozone uh, concerns we have. You know, UV light in the stratosphere uh, is the primary way that we have ozone. When you get, when you talk about ozone production, uh, and I'm not here to give you a, a chemistry lesson here, but just to say, Brilliant. love at, it at, at the at the at the ground level or closer to to ground level usually it's more of a complicated mixture of uh, chemicals and pollution that creates ozone but you have the problem is is that ozone um and we'll get into uv filters creating ozone as a byproduct you have this issue about ozone uh first of all being potentially harmful um right i mean if it's got the ability it's a right it's a radical it's unstable molecule it's trying to break things down the problem is, is what's the net effect of that is it good or bad you can argue about uh ozone half-life um, you know, in the air, picture room temperature, about three days. But I mean, I visited a resort not too long ago um, who that was their primary method of uh, sanitizing uh, each room uh, because in their mind, ozone was good. And there were rooms that hadn't been ozoned in two weeks and you could still smell a strong amount. So it's a lot of it has to do with concentration and, and things like that. But the point is, is that you're also concerned about byproducts um, or, or what we call intermediates, uh, things that be, can be created. And I always use this example because, and this is, a, this is a, what you're looking at right now is an article you can find online, there's many more, where, um, picture it this in simple languages. If you took an ozone generator and took it to a candle store, or there may be lots of like terpenes and these types of chemicals, one of the byproducts is formaldehyde. Yeah. And, and so most of you understand that word formaldehyde, we understand it not to be a good thing. And we, we, we hear too many reports about people reacting adversely to that ozone. So getting back on track with um, this comp topic that we're having about ozone bombs, it, have, killing the mold or killing the bacteria, arguably there's not enough science and research that we're aware of to suggest that that in fact is your solution. In fact, even when you look at some of the references that are out there, they, they either imply or flat out state that there's more non-viable present than there are viable. It's something, I mean, we have this huge book, right? And I mean, this doesn't even, this you, isn't even typical. I know what you're saying, but 
just give a brief definition of non-viable versus viable. Okay, so the ability for like, for example, a mold spore or structure to be able to grow on a Petri dish, you call them settled plates, where there's an auger, there's a medium. If it can't grow, but it's present, we would call that non-viable. There's other reasons why it may not grow on that Petri dish. This is not that podcast, but the bottom line is if it doesn't grow, some a layman may look at that and go, wow, man, this, 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 this ozone or this fogging agent really was the solution and this particular company saved me tens of thousands of dollars maybe but may probably not according to the research because it's the about answer is no cancer. according to blood we're pulling on people who have had ozone bombed and you see where the struggle is for those of you that are listening is that it takes a village you have the environmental perspective which is like you're not removing the source and every there's just a lot of things wrong with that there are exceptions to the rule where something is just not able to be removed due to cost or, or physical access but there's the clinical side, and that's why we're having this, you know, open mic session. So, I think um, that was a, a awesome review for me. And I think the the big take home from what I'm hearing from you is, regardless of the method, and we're going to get to filters here in a minute. Uh, you have to have removal of viable and non-viable spores, or we're going to continue seeing chronic inflammation and symptoms in that patient. And dry fogging doesn't work to do that. We've, we we uh, see that ozone bombs doesn't work to do that. And we've, uh, we want them to work. Believe me, I'm the first guy who says, wow, could there be a quick fix where ozone creeps into the walls and kills everything and doesn't- Oh, we want that miracle, anything. trust me. And when that comes, we will, we will video cast about it. You know? right. and, and Mike and I will just go hunting and fishing and uh and you guys will all be healthy I'm yeah it's all it's all about total picture and really what you need and I, and I want to stay on task with filters and stuff like that too but it's really about navigating it's also working with somebody who can help you through this very complicated situation yeah. you know some of it maybe does need to be remediated maybe there is a part about maybe there is like a wet fog or something where it's not trying to kill it's trying to drop particles mm -hmm. out of the air that sort of thing so it's this this video cast we don't have a month to record of what it would take to really get into the science and have a chalkboard behind me, that sort of thing. But the, the bottom line is that um, killing, in my experience, hasn't been an effective solution. Source removal is because then there's nothing to ask about. There's nothing to talk about. And I would also add to that, um, I don't think we need to belabor it because I want to cover some other topics and, and pick your brain. Um, people are getting UV filters put on their HVAC systems. And again, we're not saying that's a bad idea. And actually some of the HRV systems that you're introducing are, are using UV, but you're killing and filtering the air. It's not just a UV filter. You're all running that through filtration of the air. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the, the issue with UV is that um, it was originally marketed to kill things and, and, there, and the, the public was like, that sounds good. And no one really thought, especially again in the chronic industry, uh, chronic illness industry, which uh, is the primary audience here, uh, that 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 wasn't solving the problem. And, and I, again, you could get into the debate. You can talk about there's not even enough dwell time for a mold spore or a back, you know, a bacteria cell to fly through the ductwork at you know 500 to 900 feet per minute to be zapped by the UV light enough to kill yeah. it. So it was a it was a misconception. It was mismarketed. It, it wasn't uh, the, the education wasn't there. The other issue was a byproduct. We talked about, you know, UV light creating ozone. Uh, we're basically putting a sun uh, in, in our in our duct work, and 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 the question was, is is it creating enough ozone uh, to cause adverse health response? G generally, in the world of chronic illness, the expression I give with people is, your equi your life is represented by an equation, except it's not x plus y equals z. It's like uh, it's like X plus, and then there's like a hundred more variables right. equals whatever. And so we're saying we're not a hundred percent sure, but everything that talks about ozone beyond ambient levels of exposure in the air usually isn't a good thing. So let's just remove it from the equation. Let's just not put it there. Here's the exception. We do deal with certain situations where, um, uh, say it's in a more humid climate and you have an evaporative coil. This is on your air conditioning. This is how you get that nice cool air coming out of, uh, of your duct work. And perhaps because of the moisture load and the demand that your system's going through, the system could use a sterilization uh, of the of the UV uh, of the coil using UV. That's not necessarily now designing to tell you that it's like cleaning your air, but that it's really sterilizing the coil itself 
to -hmm. minimize microbial buildup, buildup of biofilms and things Mm -hmm. like that. Don't forget what I said before. It's, you know, it could create ozone. Are there, are there new lamps that they're coming out with that really create just small trace, almost really non-detectable amounts of ozone? That's what we hear. But somebody show me the document that says this is the acceptable amount of ozone that you can be exposed to. So we really want to save using ozone as a sterilization of your coil for those, those situations where you're having chronic problems with your air conditioning system. And the, 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 uh, the alternative would be to replace the system, which maybe you can't afford to do. You're hearing another narrative, which is it's complicated and working with a professional IEP is going to be probably beneficial, somebody who understands that chronic illness and, and paying attention to those details. Well, I use the word for myself that I, I hope till the day I die, I remain medically curious. And it's hard to find people in the IEP world who are uh, building curious, you know, they kind of fall into their, we're going to do some sports, uh, traps, we're going to do some air sampling. We'll get this real estate turned over. We'll get this building sold. Um, then there's the IEPs that we need for our patient population like you, who are going to critically think and challenge all of these notions. And what I would say about the, the UV is it brings up for me another problem. Um, maybe not a fad, but a, a true problem where people in Colorado, maybe Arizona, they want their air a little bit more moist and they put uh, humidification onto an HVAC system, you trigger this in me because the coil, keeping that microbial growth down, we will often see those humidification systems are riddled with microbial growth. They'll be moldy. We also see, and you're the land of of swamp cooler. Uh, Who thought of this idea? to pull in air, run it over water on a machine that gets full of leaves and, and mold food, and then pump that moist uh, microbial laden air into a home. And how many of us have heard, I was doing much better um, until the summer, and that's when they turned on their swamp cooler. Yeah, real quick on swamp coolers. I mean, we know that it's cooling through evaporation. We all understand the concept of evaluation. Go run, work up a sweat, let a cool breeze hit you across. That sweat sweat evaporates. It feels like it almost gives you a chill at times. Uh, the concept was good, and it was good in certain application. And you will see a lot more swamp coolers in dry climates like Arizona, like Colorado, things of that nature. But it's also, let's just put it this way, in the summertime, I get a lot of phone calls uh, from people who they'll call up and the, the nature of the conversation goes something like, not sure what's going on, but there's mold growing in my closet or there's mold growing literally on my computer seat. And the first thing I'll ask them, because these are, you know, not necessarily normal things that, you know, if they said I have mold growing underneath my kitchen sink, I'm going to think, you know, a kitchen sink leak. I'll ask them, do they have a swamp cooler? And every single time it's, I have a swamp cooler and they're just pumping in. Um, you got moisture levels of, uh, you know, 90, 95% or more relative humidity, if you want to use that as a measurement, coming out of the duct work, and you're, you're getting levels uh, st- sustained of 80% plus over weeks and months, and that becomes an environment conducive for growth. So yeah, going back to uh, your humidifier comment that you initially brought up, it's a trick because uh, beyond, we, we talk so much about lowering relative humidity, keeping it below, you'll hear different target levels. I've, I've usually said 50, 60% or less, but you don't want to go too dry because then you get into issues of like respiratory problems. You get into even issues of viruses. Why do so many people get the cold in the winter time when it's drier uh, here, things like that. There's a balance. And depending on what study you read, I have one I reference in my reports to clients where it's like 40 to 60%. So I understand the concept of using a humidifier, but it becomes a maintenance item. It becomes a point of some of these humidifiers have a wicking filter on them, similar to a a swamp cooler, where they drain the water over this filter, then the air blows through it. And that's how they inject this moisture laden air. And no, most people, I would argue it wasn't, but years ago that I even knew that was how they accomplished that on some setups, you'd pull over in the access panel to the humidifier and the wicking filter it looked like a science experiment. It was literally loaded with microbial growth. So obviously, I don't necessarily that the solution is get rid of it because you may have a respiratory issue where too dry is a problem for you, but it's about making sure that you're checking it more periodically and even more than seasonal, you may want to go in there on a weekly basis and just make sure that everything's looking kosher. Right. Uh, I have a delivery man. I'll be right back. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I would love you to talk about uh, layout for us. What are some of the Band-Aid fixes? Uh, honoring that we still have more work to do in the house. But Absolutely. What, what are we going to talk about on fixes? 
Yeah, fix is a good thing that came up too, and I'll share my screen for for the audience was use of filters. Um, we came up with uh, uh, this idea of you know people talk all about uh, quality of filters, what to use. Um, we're we're not recommending filters here in this application uh, to do your remediation job. This is more of a maintenance uh, item. So uh, what what are the filters? Uh, how do they work? Uh, you have right here a chart, uh, standard fifty two. It's an ASHRAE. Uh, guide, if you will, that kind of talks about MERV rating, uh, minimum efficiency reporting value here on the left-hand side here, highlighting that for you now. Um, and then obviously different levels. Most homes will have like your basic air filters. You know, you'll have like a MERV 6, maybe a MERV 8. And these are just guidelines. You know, it's talking about like, you know, what, what kind of a contaminant could this take care of that sort of thing. Um, it's not meant to be um, absolute. It's just to give you broad ideas. But you'll notice that even like a, a MERV 8 filter, which again is a common household filter, not, you know, that's lower end pleated filter, um, will give you uh, at or slightly better than 90% uh, efficacy at removal of particle sizes at three to 10 microns. And some of you may be raising your hands going, well, that's good right now, because I noticed right underneath that I see mold spores. Well, mold spores, we go back to those things that there's arguably way more fragments than there are these big heavy mold spores, not to mention the fact that heavier, heavier particles are typically not going to be removed with filters. And that has to get into the science of um, uh, aerodynamic uh, sizes of particles and how they behave in a sedentary environment, an environment that's quiet. It's not outside. There's not a big wind. You don't have laminar flow going on. So most of your larger particles are going to end up being settling out. There, I don't have an exact number for you because a lot of it depends on uh, how your house is, is built, um, where it's at, in, you know how it's affected from the outside. Um, reservoirs, um, sources, but arguably where, where I start to see um, uh, HEPA filter grade uh, media diminish in its ability to, to lower particle counts are about five microns and higher. And I've done this with particle counters. There, years ago, I would, I've used them on thousands of homes. And, and it's, it's no surprise that the larger particles aren't being really effectively removed because they're not getting sucked in. You understand that if there is a heavier spore in the air and it um, is 10 feet away from your portable air scrubber or from the return vent that you have in your home that it's not going to suck it into it. It's going, the particle's going to drop. And so it's a combination of a good household cleaning, which we can talk about more in a second. I see that Eric's back, but also about the fact that really that where a filter is going to do a better job for you is in removing the smaller particles. Well, if it's, if it's going to remove the smaller particles because the smaller particles are the ones that are going to be floating around the air more. They're going to react. They're going to diffuse in the air like smoke. You know, it's like when mom or dad or your brother and sister cook popcorn in the kitchen. You can smell in the bedroom on the other side of the house because that the oils and whatnot are so small that it diffuses and you smell it. And so you want to get a higher efficiency uh, filter, whether it's a portable system. Uh, there's different brands that are out there. Um, I, I, it, uh, hard to say which one's better. I know that a lot of it's in the marketing and the quality of the build, but if you bought even a lower end Honeywell unit for $250 versus a higher end model, you've heard different terms, um, uh, the ones that are out there, which I have no problem mentioning these uh, Air Oasis, um, IQ Air, things like that, you'll find that they will have higher reported MERV values and they're going to remove those 0.3 microns or even smaller, which are arguably where these are going to do the most productive good for you. They're going to be removing a lot of the, and we see it. If you had a particle counter right in front of you and you turned on that machine, you'll watch that 0.3 mi mi micron and even a little bit larger uh, particle sizes drop significantly. So air filters, I think, are a good way um, to reduce exposure. There's a little bit of debate in the industry about if it's really doing that much good for you. No one's going to say don't put a good air filter in there because the concept is if you lower total particle count, you're lowering your, lowering your exposure. So uh, good filters are great to have, whether or not it's a whole house filter. There's other topics we can get into with filtration, but we want to typically get this high MERV rated filter you can get. Probably a MERV 12 or a MERV 13 is about as comfortable as you can get with a standard air conditioning system before you really want to start working with a local air conditioning company to make sure that they're not putting a, a filter that has a too high of a MERV rated. So imagine that one, the MERV 20 at the top of the list. That one is a great filter, but it causes so much resistance. The air has to really struggle to get through. It puts a, 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 a load 
on your on your air conditioning system that's moving that air. You might think, gosh, is that a bad thing? It's like I'm straining the engine of my furnace if you want to look at it that way. And the answer is yes, but there's solutions to get around that. Maybe your system does have a strong variable speed motor on it. Maybe it doesn't. You work with a local air conditioning company who can come in and put like say an ECM motor or a multi-stage variable speed motor. It's basically like putting a stronger motor in your car, except you're doing it in your furnace so that it can handle those higher MERV rated filters to do a better job at removing the very small particles of which are going to be the primary exposure in your home when we're talking about small particles versus a larger spot particle size like a mold spore. Boy, you just triggered a, a mind explosion in my brain on thoughts and questions. My, my, my first thought for the audience is that well beyond SIRS, air quality matters. If you're a business owner and you want more productivity, out of your employees. Clean air matters. If you have allergies, you don't have SIRS, you have grass pollen, you have uh, elder, you have cottonwood, pine pollen allergies. Filtering that out is, is the big deal. And it goes back to some of, I remember ORAC had like a infomercial on z z z z z zapping these things. And again, it brings back common sense things. Thinking is not so common. And we go back to this, whether you're dealing with SIRS or allergies, pull it out, filtration over killing something. Right. It's almost like your filter's the binder. You know, it's really mm -hmm. removing some of these contaminants from the, from the home. So it's, yeah. it's, a good, it's a good thing to do. I mean, everything you read about, I pulled up a, a couple of, uh, of references. Um, this one was done um, back in 2001. Um, uh, through a Berkeley study, um, you can read the title there, Firm Performance and Cost of Particle Air Filtration Technologies. William J. Fisk is um, a, a well-known name in this industry for indoor air quality. Bottom line is that, you know, he talks about, he does this study with different types of filters, and it's just one study. And no, again, no one's going to argue that a filter can remove particles. Um, it's just about uh, appreciating the limitations of them. I think part of, um, a good air filter is going to be a good part of the, the total plan. Just like when you're treating CIRS, it's not just the protocol. It's also diet, diet and lifestyle and choices and other issues. I mean, even if you want to go, go any hopper and the neuro retraining on me, that even is a new thing that I think should be a, a healthier part of, of a process of healing and get better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's only one part of it. I think that yeah. filtration is fabulous. You also need to look at mechanical ventilation uh, to yeah. get that fresh air into the home. Yeah, well, I think the before we get on mechanical ventilation, which which – brings the, the point where I'm about to bring up is things like the Air Oasis, see, even though it's a decent design and, and um, has some benefit, you have this little mini fan on that thing. And in theory, filtration can really work if you can turn over the air, but you're Enough. not going to have right. a little filter on your desk and be filtering ketomium particles that are, that are in the corner 10 feet away. Right. And that's where, you know, in our office, uh, to, to extra polish the air, we have the, the IQ Air Professional Series, the $900 filter, and, and you know, caveat, uh, emptor, buyer beware, you're going to do about one to $300 of filter changes in that per year. So there's a maintenance there, but it is a very effective filter at, and, and I don't get any financial royalties from IQ Air, but it does things right on filtration. Uh, even that with the big motor that has six settings. Yeah, there it is. Are you, there it is. Are you pulling, and, and you guys taught me this, are we turning over the air? Versus right. in, in our commercial building, you have a giant filter where Myers uh, Plumbing and Heating come and change the filters every six months in the top roots and branches building, and you're turning over air through your HVAC system so that, it, that it's more likely to get cleaned, where or at some point, maybe uh, with these MERV values, putting uh, the best possible filter on the whole system HVAC, whether, whether it be for commercial or residential, is, is how we're going to get in front of this a little bit. But we'll always put an IQ air in someone whose C4A isn't coming down. We've got a clean hertz from you. We can't quite figure it out. They're not at a moldy church or moldy CrossFit box or moldy yoga studio or moldy office. It seems like their buildings are pretty clean. And they do much better. Um, with that IQ air in, you know, a 10 by 15, a 10 by 10, an 8 by 12 room, uh, we just don't expect that filter to be able to turn the entire air over in that house. 
And it even comes with wheels. It's like a little r 2 d unit, which is telling you, move me around. Plug me in over here. Plug me right. in over there. Plug me in over here. So well, and you brought up a good point. Even in your example, I was just doing some math. I don't think I was ignoring you. I was doing some math on my computer or my phone. Um, it's all about air changes. And <laughs> even this study talks about, you know, uh, in order for there to be a certain level of effectiveness of reduction, they're not talking about CIRS in the study. They're just talking about more of a, an objective reduction in particles, we're correlating that with a good thing here, is that you have to move enough air. And so that's why normally we do look at whole house filtration, that is the system or the ducted system you already have, because you're moving anywhere from about 1100 to even up to 1800 per system, cubic feet per minute. So you know, look a cubic mm -hmm. foot times 1800 of them a minute, you're filtering a lot of air changes, uh, a lot of the air in that represents that building you know, whereas a smaller unit, whether or not it's Air Oasis, whether or not it's I, uh, Austin Air, uh, these are true filtration units. They're actually filtering the air. They're not a purification technology, although that's another topic, the, the misuse of the word purification or the confusion of that word. You're filtering, you're not moving as much air, but even, even your system, your IQ Air, uh, is moving 300 plus cubic feet per minute on its high setting. Um, and that's a lot of air in, a, in, in that example you use of a 10 by 10 room where if you do the math, you're doing multiple air changes per hour. Yeah. And, and that's no surprise that, and by the way, this is not a, the point here is not to say that you do this in lieu of remediation of a known source. Mm -hmm. This is no different than a dry fogging thing. This mm -hmm. argument here is how can we create and maintain a sanctuary once you have removed sources? Because maybe there's this inherent question that's starting to form in your head right about now, which is, well, if I remove the sources, doesn't that remove that I'm, I'm not going to have a problem? The answer is not so clear because we have been in a number of homes where we've, we've identified and remediated as many areas that we can, but A, there may be something we'll never be able to find without hiring a, in a bulldozer to bulldoze down your hound house. And second of all, your house is a box. You live in a confined space. How many of you feel better when you go outside and get some of that fresh air action? Yeah. Um, where you go inside into a confined space. Let's just pretend for a convenient example that you don't have a, 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 an actively communicating source from some hidden space in your, your, your home. You may still have an adverse reaction. You could just have a buildup of outdoor contaminants. Mm -hmm. What? Outdoor contaminants? What? I've never heard of that. And so we're trying to create and maintain a sanctuary. One way to do that is to lower those particle loads. Going with whole house filtration is probably the easiest way to get there. Um, if you don't have it, you're going to be looking at portable filtration. And for those of you who have ducted, you can still supplement like Eric does in his Roots and Branches office. He doesn't just have good filtration going on in the whole house, or I'm sorry, the whole building system. He's also got an, an IQ Air running in his lounge where his patients sit that run. We call that supplemental. It's like a little bit more. We'll just lower those levels even better. To, to just minimize, remember that equation I was mentioning where it's like not two variables, it's 100? One yeah. of the variables in your equation is I wonder if the particle loads are high enough and whatever they may represent, those particles could be anything, um, if we could lower them uh, enough to where you don't have a reaction. So we don't have an easy way to say you need this many particles or less to get better. We just know that if we can slam that concentration as low as possible, that that's hopefully going to equal a safe enough environment for you to recover. Yep. Yeah, and it's, it's a, a good story to share. Uh, Salty Kitty, may she rest in peace. We had a cat named Sea Salt. She was a beautiful uh, gray-striped kitty. And uh, I honestly think one of our mitigation remediations, we need, uh, we need to kill her. Like, just she couldn't handle another one. But may, may she rest in peace. And, and what she would do is, what I learned, the spiritual journey for me and SIRS was, um, God whispered in my ears, if it doesn't have a heartbeat, throw it out. So basically what I need is uh, a laptop, a bowl, uh, a couple of fork, a knife, my kids, my wife, my, my one cat, right? So, so we hoard things because of feelings of inadequacy, right? We, we say, oh, I got to hold on to all these books. Like this is what's left of my books. I had about eight times those bookshelves because I had a fear of being enough as a doctor. And all they were were more mold food to collect. Right? These are the ones that I actually use and resource. So it gets interesting in regards to the spiritual journey of, am I a hoarder? What am I holding on to? Why do I hold on to these? Why does my brain work? And one of the things that I would do is I would hoard books and I would hoard reclaimed building materials. 
because one day I'm going to build the picnic table with this wow. redwood that I pulled over on the side of the street and rescued from the landfill, right? Um, Carpenter and, right out of the big book right there, man, just following in his footsteps. Here's your blue collar, white collar, uh, boulder organic hippie, right? I'm going to save the redwood piece uh, from going into the trash. And I had a giant wood pile in my backyard, and it and I had it tarped, you know, so it wouldn't look like uh, Sanford and Son bending with all my junk pile in the backyard. And and the the tarp held for a year or two. Then the Colorado sun broke down the tarp, and whenever it would rain or thunderstorm, water started to penetrate into my wood pile. And sea salt, the kitty, would get scared of lightning storms. And where would she jump into? Under the tarp, into the wood pile. And when she would nuzzle with me, I would actually get symptomatic. And these are back in the days of the mold plates and I had learned better and started using Hertz Mies and I had some of these mold plates. So I just pinged her a little bit with the mold plate and the mold plate was full of aspergillus. And uh, I went when we finally, I think we threw out 16 full dumpsters of personal and rip out stuff. Uh, when we finally got rid of the wood, it was covered in aspergillus. So the thunder would come, sea salt would run into the wood pile, would lay in the aspergillus, then would vector the aspergillus into our home. Do we have a water yeah. damage mold problem behind the wall? Not no, necessarily. Not necessarily. Once you've done your work, now again, later we've had multiple follow-up water damage experiences, supply line leaks and stuff like that. But in that situation, that's where um, – you know, our IQ air moving 300 cubic feet a minute is going to help clear some of the uh, molds from the outside world that humans and pets can bring into your home. I want to talk about, uh, too, I know, I know you're running a lot of the questions, you, uh, the ones that I'm peeking at on my cheat sheet over here are ones from you. And before we get into mechanical ventilation, um, the, the issue of... Um, particle re removal again is just as a recap the whole point of it is that you're just trying to lower the counts as much as possible um yeah. you're not trying to be impossible we're not turning this into some sort of a clean room iso you know 6000 type standard or class this or class that we're just trying to be realistic it's not that you necessarily need that type of environment but you know you're still encouraged to open up doors and windows when it's you know a good season you don't have a forest fire you know uh, upstream uh, kind of a thing and it, it's just it's about we'll save this for another podcast. Maybe the title can be just living in the real versus living uh, in a textbook, impossible lifestyle, but yeah. air, air filtration is, is a part of the battle. Um, there's enough information obviously out there to do as good as you can. It doesn't mean that if you have a Merv 8 that, you know, your arm's going to fall off. I mean, any filtration is better than none. And we can see that improvement. Keep in, in mind, a lot of these studies talk about percentage, like this is only 50% good. That's per pass. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to pass and you're going to constantly be scrubbing that air, blah, blah, blah. Mechanical ventilation um, is is key, and I I know I'm I'm jonesing to talk about it because it's it's such an important topic. Um, there there are different opinions you get about mechanical ventilation. For those of you who don't know, uh, think about natural ventilation in terms of opening up a window or a door. You're naturally ventilating your house, but there are times uh, during the year where you won't leave a door and window. For Colorado, it's primarily during the winter time, and for Arizona, it's primarily in the summertime too hot. And, and so when you create that closed door box, um, and especially the boxes of today that are built even tighter than ever before to meet energy efficiency issues, it's kind of an indoor, uh, it's an inverse relationship with indoor air quality, a tighter box, you're throwing in like uh, more toxic products like press woods versus um, solid lumber and things like that. That's a whole other topic. Um, mechanical ventilation is going to help dilute and purge a lot of the contaminants that aren't going to be addressed uh, with your air filtration media, whether you got whether you're rocking a MERV 16 or a MERV 6 or whatever, in the range of 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 how different um, filtration or dilution methods work, there's not really a one-stop shop that we're aware of. So oftentimes, in, in the in drier climates, there's two primary things in terms of what you can do to manipulate the air that we offer, one of which is the filtration, which we tackled a lot on. And the other one is mechanical ventilation, where you're mechanically bringing in a device. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's independent, usually run under its own power, and you're ducting that system, that fresh air from the outside. You're typically filtering it first. You're typically heating it or cooling it first before it ever makes its way. Um, and I'm only gonna pick on this one website because for those of you that are like me and go visual all the time, I want you to see this. 
this is kind of like what we're rocking when we're talking about a mechanical ventilation system. Mm -hmm. It's this ability to uh, bring in outdoor air, inject it into a ducted system. If you don't have any duct work, don't worry. They can, they can, duct, they can run a couple of uh, runs into the home and dilute contaminants by purging the environment, uh, bringing in that outdoor fresher, lower concentration air that you're still filtering for those of you who are worried about those high pollen count days. And right now it's pretty bad. So if you hear that stuffiness, that's why. Um, and, 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 and there is research. This was a study that I talked about at a conference uh, back in 2015. In fact, it was the first conference I met Eric at. And, and, and it's just, again, there's science out there. This is not some bar napkin idea where, you know, I've conveniently like highlighted areas they, they, they looked at different ventilation methods. And for just, just going to give you a little 101, maybe a touch on 202 in terms of the levels of, of information here, there's two different types of, of ventilation that we support. Uh, one is an ERV or HRV. That's kind of like that, that, that picture you just saw a moment ago. And then there is central fan integrated supply of ventilation, which basically they're, they're bringing in air from the outside through a fan and they're utilizing your duct work to in your system to distribute that air. Bottom line, they saw an immediate reduction in VOCs and particulates, got it highlighted right there, um, mm -hmm. with those two systems. Now, you, you as a listener can do what you want, but it's the same argument that we've talked about. No one's writing you a prescription or a guarantee right now. But if you're lowering the contaminants in the home, this was documented, this was a, a study done, I believe it was in Texas, but it was two homes side by side, and they, they, they tested these, different products using tracer contaminants to, to track improvement with its use. And they notice a significant, you can see the numbers there, 85%, 73% reduction in small particles, 0.3 to 2 microns. That says something. VOC reduction down to half of what they were uh, prior uh, to the use of these systems. You, when you hear me talking to your patients or to my clients about mechanical ventilation and filtration, it's because we understand it's not just about removing the cancer, it's about creating and maintaining the sanctuary. And you've given me constructive criticism in the, pack, in the past and helped push me, guide me, motivate me of that importance because you still can have people who have problems living in a box with no known or identified cancers and that you really got to do more for them and create a, it's not a clean room. It's just a, cl a cleaner environment that gives your body a chance to fight and get better because there's a whole host of things that are going on in the body that are beyond my pay grade that you understand as a clinician. And we're trying to, we're trying to curve the odds back into the uh, occupants or the patient's favor by creating that safe environment for them. So it's an awesome talk you gave in 2014. And I remember saying, wow, I want to have lunch with that guy because a lot of the reasons people aren't getting better is we're still not in front of uh, remove that obstacle of cure, which is they're still exposed to um, particulates. And in honor of the the late great Will Spay, it's a dear friend of ours. Um, his famous saying was "Build tight, ventilate right." And what we're saying is, 1973, OPEC crashed. And and for those of you who are alive, you remember you had to wait in long lines to get gas. And what happened is the EPA said we can't burn so much coal to heat our homes and everything has a yin and a yang to it. Obviously I'm in Boulder. I'm, I'm progressive when it comes to um, saving the humans. I don't believe in earth day. I believe it's saved the humans day. The earth is fine. It is us that's going to go bye bye. Um, but we want to save the humans day and we want to burn less coal to, to, to do that and have less particulate in, in regards to things like asthmas and allergies, but also um, for carbon, but when you build tight, which is what a lot of the bolder building practices are now, spray foam, over insulate, use R14 uh, windows, and uh, what happens is air doesn't move much. You don't have fresh air. The older homes, even though you're burning coal uh, uh, like the Dickens, you would have lath and plaster and homes would breathe and, and they were super leaky and fresh air would come in and out. And we're not having that anymore with some of our modern practices. So even things like VOCs, microbial VOCs from, from, from water damage building growth, but things like off gas and carpets and formaldehyde laden uh, fire retardant mattresses, these chemicals are now getting trapped. And what Michael's saying is extremely important for my house because uh, as he knows, we don't have an HVAC system. We're heated on piped water. 
So we don't, we literally don't have fresh air coming into our home. And this is the last step for, for, for our home. When we did our tax credit uh, through Boulder City to say, hey, we're good uh, hippies who are trying to burn less fuel. The guy came from the city and puts these two um, door systems on your front and back door to see how airflow is. And he's like, don't button up this house anymore. And I didn't even know what he, he meant. And what he's saying is, there's no air turnover from the outside world into my home. We are just trapped air. I have, I have a, a, a carbon dioxide meter with air quality, just particulates in the air that does indoor and outdoor. And my, my CO2 levels in this house can get really high if we have lots of guests and activity because we literally don't turn over air. So what Mike's helping uh, with our house is putting in what's called a heat recovery ventilator. And again, it's one of these systems that pulls in fresh air, filters it, and then uses um, the heat that we've already put in the home to, to, if it's a winter day, to warm up that air as it's coming in, save some money on our, um, on our bills, but also make sure that the Dorninger family is, is breathing fresh uh, air. We live in a middle class, uh, 2,300, 2,400 square foot home, pretty modest. And to install a system in there, we do not have duct work. To put in the ducts and the HRV, it's gonna be about $11,000. So it's not cheap, but uh, at the end of the day, in regards to how much we've spent on cholestyramine and VIP and, and getting our family treated, um, building that air quality, that air palace where the family can, can come home and all of our genetics can just calm down and heal and sleep. We're spending at least eight hours a day in our home. It's more like, you know, eight to 16. Uh, I, I think we're going to see some good changes. And, and that's the last step we have for, for our home. Yeah, I think you, you hit that on the head in terms of just that observational it, even the, the real life number of, you know, $11,000, by the way, you know, uh, for those again, listening, you know, it's also not uncommon to have a, a whole house system like that installed three or four or $5,000, especially if you already have the duck work, obviously, right. uh, Eric's situation is differs, but it's again, don't freak out on because there's always other options, you know, we're kind of giving you what we recommend and prefer, um, you know, can, you can always work backwards uh, from any situation, uh, because you know, you can chip away towards success. Just a real 30 second bit here on this picture is a, a graph or actually a, a picture of different climate zones. And as you can tell, it's not perfectly dotted in terms of, you know, by county or zip code, but you get an idea where uh, there's a basic difference in mechanical ventilation between using a, an energy recovery ventilator and a heating recovery ventilator. Both, both offer the ability to bring in fresh air. The ERV uh, adds this uh, component to help uh, regulate moisture better in your home. Um, again, probably going to save this for another uh, podcast, getting into the, the, the weeds with uh, mechanical ventilation and choices. But the takeaway here is to work with a local air conditioning company, ask them if, you know, they can they do mechanical ventilation? What's the right uh, type of unit for my, for my environment? And if you are wanting a second opinion, you can reach out to some of the IEP professionals. Uh, you can find a lot of us uh, either on survivingmold.com. I got to tell you, ICI.org has a list now of professionals, basically people who understand more about, you know, it, what, what is the total consequence to this? I mean, are we bringing in fresh air, but are we not filtering it first? Because a, a mechanical air conditioning company may not be thinking in terms of that chronic illness perspective. They may not be thinking that we should add a MERV-13 filter on the inlet of that outcoming air. Um, and, and this is this because we're tip of the spear. We're talking about, we're talking about new stuff here. This is not, this is not something they'd normally do with the majority of the population, which is some, you know, healthy triathlete that may not be a representation of the average, uh, healthy adult in the U S but the point is, is that they're not used to working with chronic illness and paying attention to those details. So add this to your, your book of knowledge, uh, mechanical ventilation is another you, good thing. Can you keep that up for a second? Yeah. Um, so just three quick uh, refining points. Down here in Florida, you see that, um, that um, orange, you see also there in Houston, the orange, right? The hurricanes, uh, hot and humid. My first service patient from Florida was so balanced compromised from his brain dysfunction from SERS that he tripped and fell into his wall and literally fell through the sheetrock like uh, a dead body, you would uh, outline the chalk line. Oh, wow. he, he literally fell through the sheetrock. And on the other side, he saw black mold. 
and he didn't even realize he was SERS at the time. He had heard that we're a clinic of mystery illness. He came and saw us. I said, well, that might have something to do with your illness. What was happening to his home was because of the 100% humidity levels down in Florida, the moisture, remember, spores are in the Mojave Desert. You have mold spores anywhere on the planet. They need two main ingredients, uh, food and water. Uh, American homes are mold food. It's the three little pig story. We build with paper and pulp, right? Remember the third brother built with brick like they do in Austria, right? No, that's not what we do here. We build the paperback, sheetrock, pulp, uh, uh, cellulose ceiling tiles, cellulose carb paddings. This is mold food. The missing ingredient is, is water. Where Mike and I live, we live in these dry climates. As long as you didn't uh, add the kibosh with a swamp cooler, you don't have a supply line leak to your refrigerator or a uh, basement that flooded, et cetera, et cetera, you don't have to deal with this orange section here on these humidity levels. So Will Spates, our colleague, he would ha ha actually have to put on these ERV systems that he could only get uh, in Mexico where they would pull air from the outside world, they would dehumidify it, filter it, and then put a positive pressure. If you hung a little piece of tissue paper up, you'd see just a little bit of a breeze in the home to keep the inside walls dry so that mold with all the humidity and moisture water source they have did, doesn't eat homes from the outside in. Yeah, Will, and, Will, back when he was around, and you're right, he was a good one um, who passed away not too long ago. Um, he introduced me to what you're talking about as a venting dehumidifier. And, you know, it was a, a good, a good option for that climate because we still want fresh air, but these hot, yeah. humid climates pose new tr uh, challenges, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of moisture you have outside tropical climates are no different for, you know, those of you living on the islands or that sort of thing of uh, to be able to bring in, but you got to be able to condition or, or clean that air first. And so, yes, great point on that, Eric. And um, it, it Fundamentally, we can talk about it for, uh, you know, it, it, there's so much science involved. Um, for those of you that have a good feel on it, that's great. For those of you who need help, you have these resources that we've already mentioned you can go to. I'll try to even put a couple notes on the uh, bottom of the video so you can kind of refer to things if you need help and guidance and helping install, helping understand uh, the science a little bit more than what we've talked about with why, how this could benefit and improve the indoor air quality in your home. Yeah, and, and I'll add uh, one, other, one other tidbit on the ERV or the, or the HRV. You may have difficulty finding local um, HVAC companies who are willing to do this. Yeah, uh, that's true. In, in Boulder, we have a guy that Mike actually um, has heroically uh, supported on, on figuring this out. He's a super sharp guy on, on how to do HVAC systems, and he plugged and played pretty easily into the HRV, ERV systems but you're kind of looking for that engineering nerd who's really into airflow and, and gradients and, 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 and uh, in, into the, the science of uh, mechanical ventilation to plug in on this. So for our roots and branches patients, for the Boulder folk, uh, if, if you think an HRV or an ERV is, is necessary, you can reach out to us. And he's, he's a little bit difficult to, to get in touch with because he does all the traditional stuff, the, the boilers and the, and the H. So to sneak in our project sometimes can be a headache, but we're really looking to the last step for our home. And I think you're going to, again, get benefit out of less histamine spikes, better sleep quality, better oxygenated sleep, in addition to just keeping particular counts down. Uh, well, this, pro this proves that we need to do another podcast in more detail, which we will for the viewers eventually. I'll put that in line uh, to talk more about the in-depths of not just the details, the weeds of HRVs and filtration, a little bit deeper talk, but how to find kind of instructions on how to find those local resources. Because it's not simple. It's not something we can cover in three minutes. For sure. And it's something that I honestly don't feel comfortable um, putting up on our website because what can happen is sometimes we'll overwhelm someone's business with our referrals because we know they're good at something. And then all of a sudden they stop calling people back six months later. And well, and this is what happened with like a lot of uh, folks is they get so good at what they do or, or they're, they're, they're helping so many people. There's just yeah. not the demands there. The supply's not. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So a real quick anecdotal before we kind of wrap it up and give our punchlines here. Um, I want to show you guys the IQ Atom. So I, I just love the IQ Air because, again, they focus on that concept of filtering the air, cleaning the air, pulling particulate out of the air uh, for a fix. 
And what I do when I go, I'm going again to Burlingham to do Funk Endo, and, and I don't have Oprah money to have them do a Hurts Me on the hotel I'm going to teach at before I go. So what I've been doing is I bring my IQ Atom. This is the um, IQ Air, the, the $900 filter made into, uh, same technology, but made into a personal air filter. And I try and create a little Eric air bubble just in case the, uh, the, um, uh, mo the, the hotel is problematic. And what I do is I put this at the bottom of my podium and I have air coming up, shooting up toward me. And, and what I like to do is when I go to a hotel room, this fits nicely into my carry on spend, uh, um, budget a little more time for TSA because they always will pull this out and, and say, what the hell is that thing? You got a, a bomb or a record player or what is that thing? And I tell them, I have mold allergy. I don't even tell them SIRS, secondary to water damage buildings. I just say I have mold allergy and I need to filter the, the air in the hotels that I stay at. It benefits me. So what, what I do personally is I get to my, my hotel. I'm on my preload of cholestyramine or well call. And I literally plug in my air filter. I hang up my suit so it can start to unwrinkle. And then I go for a, a run or a walk um, and just let the air in my hotel room turn over a little bit. In the morning, I put this baby in my backpack. I set it up on my podium about 20 minutes before so I don't look like a mold nerd. And, uh, and I let the air filter at my podium. And I don't like direct airflow. It, it, it's a little agitating to the liver chi. Um, so I have it just a little bit set off. And what we're trying to do here is just create a bubble. And again, like, like Mike is saying, we're not saying that is uh, uh, a perfect long-term fix. But since doing that, I, I feel like I can even tolerate a building that's borderline. We're going to go out to some hotels and teach, and, and it just smells like wet dog. And you're like, shit, I'm going to uh, you know, have a little bit of a regression here. It's going to take me a couple weeks to, to rebound from this but I want my life to be as building liberal as possible. So, you know, preloading with the cholestyramine meaning it's trying to create a little bit of a IQ, that's called the Atom, A-T-E-M. Um, and it looks hip and cool. It is a conversation piece. People come up to you Especially and say- at airports. Especially at airports, yeah, or when you're, when you're teaching holistic MDs and MDs and nurse practitioners. And, um, but I love teaching, and one of the reasons I don't wanna stop doing it is I, if I can get one more doctor on the road to start screening for CIRS um, and start pulling these mystery illness patients uh, out of healthcare and help restore their quality of life so they can go um, get out of doctor's office and li live a life again, it's, it's worth doing. So I have to find my way to, um, to keep enjoying things like traveling and meeting other docs, teaching other docs, learning from them, having family vacations, uh, so on and so forth. No, and having, having a travel bag, if you will, for things to help, you know, it's got to be realistic. You're not going to be, you're not going to be loading up the uh, full size HEPA filtration system. You're not going to be loading up the duct work in the attic of your home to go to travel with having these portable devices can help a quick note. I'll try to make it less than a minute. Uh, Big difference in air filtration versus air purification. The device that uh, Eric just uh, uh, showed uh, is mainly filtration. Um, and so it's the removal of things you're filtering out. It's a better understood, uh, what I would like to say is a safer technology. Uh, purification units, uh, which, you know, the problem with what I'm telling you is that if you go look up purification, you'll find that there are air filtration systems that don't do anything else. They don't they don't add UV, they don't throw a hydroxyl radical out in the air. They still use the word purification, it's confusing, but pur pur purification is when you manipulate something in the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe you're saying there's a contaminant X and it reacts with our, our magic you know, technology and it breaks it down into harmless water vapor or CO2 or whatever. Um, I'm not here to break down, I'm, again, I'm not a chemistry major, but I can tell you that it, it's, it's a potential use to, uh, the, on the purification side of things. It's a potential thing to do. I wouldn't say it's your first go-to. I would stick with filtration or the physical removal of particles because keep in mind, a lot of chemicals and things that you may also be worried about. Think about mycotoxins for those of you who are uh, overly or concerned enough about them or VOCs. A lot of those rides on the, ride on the back of particulates. They're not necessarily free floating in nature. Um, and so, um, I mean, they are, but uh, from a t t standpoint of orders of magnitude, an, a good air filtration system is going to re reduce a lot of that period uh, for you. Um, and even looking at other things like if you're going to use a air filtration system and you're looking to have something that has a little bit more of a chemical reduction, finding something that uses like sorbent media, like activated charcoal or things like that may be a better option than going purification mode 
right off the bat. Um, the reason for that is, is similar to the ozone. You know that ozone was promoted as a uh, purification, but we understand now that it has the potential, it does produce byproducts or intermediates. We have that same concern for these other technologies that we, fought, we know far less than we know about ozone. Mm -hmm. And so it's, but we have heard, uh, it's anecdotal, it's, uh, it's subjective, but we have heard of clients who have used these purification systems and they say, hey, when I turn on the system, I feel better. We've also heard of people that turn on these systems and say, when I turn it on, I feel worse. Now, is that, is that an Annie Hopper neural retraining limbic system issue? Is that a, because it's recreating by, uh, byproducts uh, and creating a worse environment? We're not sure. Remember that? I'm going to go back a third time now. I'm going to reference it. That equation in your life is not just two variables. It's 100. And if we don't know something and it's not essential to mm -hmm. add, you may want to wait to use that type of device on the, on the back end. Think of it as more of a Hail Mary pass. Than anything else, you may not need to go that far. You could save a lot of money and you simplify your equation. You remove more variables so you have more control, more understanding of what's going on in your life. Mm. I, I think it's just such a great point. And I would piggyback on um, things like the molecule um, is an example of this purification. And we've had uh, anecdotally patients not do well on that. We've had anecdotally some patients not do well with the mild ozone byproduct of the Aeroasis, even though um, it's, it's lower than California standards for safe ozone levels. They're, they're still reacting. I, you, little, little, little firecracker under my butt, that, that trumps all that, and that is how much air is a little fan in a molecule or an Aeroasis turning over? And on the IQ Atom, what I can tell you, for this size filter, it blows. It blows on your face. It's really moving um, my local air bubble there. The, the IQ Atom also might be something uh, that we can use for an office fix where your um, HR department is willing to start looking into, is this building clean? Uh, is this, are we going to fix the building if it is problematic? But until then, you're in your little cubicle. Um, having something that can at least take the local air where you're sitting uh, for the most part and, and, and get it going is, is, is quite helpful. So is it turning over? Yeah, you're right. I think uh, the, the, the issue, and again, just 101 level, when you deal with the ability of any system to move air through its technology or the ability for a, of a certain motor to deliver a technology, when you start looking at units that are really small, it's, it's got those whole spidey senses wondering, well, what is really going on here? Uh, I will tell you, and it is subjective and it's not been substantiated yet, it's very just observational in the field and what we've seen from limited studies out of Australia and a couple other locations is that a lot of the purification technologies seem to do a better job at lowering VOC levels. And even one of the studies I shared with you earlier mentioned uh, a, P a PCO technology, which is kind of this purification breakdown things into what they would call are harmless or more, har what I would call potentially more uh, or less harmless uh, byproducts, uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, things like that. Um, but when you think about that, it, those things are really lightweight in the air. A VOC is really low and lightweight in size, and so it does diffuse. And so a smaller unit may have more impact or reduction of that contaminant, uh, even with a smaller motor, because diffusion is, is really is really working in the home and pushing a higher concentration of contaminant X towards that unit because that unit, there's a void. There's a low concentration of, of that VOC because you're creating it because the technology is working. And so more of those contaminants, those lightweights are heading to that unit and it's the, the process is just constantly working. So again, just it, there's a lot of science. We don't claim to be experts. We understand it's not linear. There's other factors that could make a unit more effective or less effective. We're not here to talk up or talk down on the units. It's just basic understanding and also kind of a little simple roadmap of if you're talking about make, creating and maintaining sanctuary, your, your criteria is definitely moisture control, removing cancers. Uh, it's also uh, good cleaning habits, not living like a hoarder, not having a bunch of surface areas in your home. You get into issues like proper drainage, things like that. We'll talk more at the next podcast a little bit about that. Uh, and also just making sure you have a good filtration system and mechanical ventilation to purge out those contaminants. Dilution is the solution for the contaminants that are not going to be removed with your filters. Mm, love it. How do you think we did for our first open mic? Yeah, there you go, baby. Okay. Hey, I, would, I would absolutely say uh, 
on that closeout, what, what, a, what a beautiful paragraph of how to think it through. Um, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Right. All right. So um, now I'm in the inner circle of Dr. Shoemaker working on this genie. And I'm going to tell you in the next 10 to 20 years, we are going to have improved, more cost effective treatments for this. It's only going to get better. But in the meantime, uh, you get those skeptical hippo eyes on anything that is looking too good to be true. So in other words, I like that IQ Air uh, that we have in our office. It's a $900 filter. It's about the size of an R2-D2, right? So it's bulky, it's big. It's about one to $300 in maintenance. You can get your fingers caught when you're changing those filters. It's like wrestling an alligator, uh, crocodile hunter style. That's so right. there, there, there's, again, it's a wonderful filter um, and I appreciate it. And learning today on, on setting six, we're pulling 300 cubic feet a minute through that thing. And if you look under the bottom of it, there's so many dust bunnies that are stuck on that thing. Once you get it running for a little bit, I actually vacuum the bottom of that thing because it's pulling, it's really turning over air. So just common sense thinking it, it, it's proving to me it's pulling air. So if something's too good to be true, it's too good to be true or we're going to video cast about it. Yeah, no kidding, huh? Or celebrate the hallelujah moment. You can get the best filter in the world for two bucks. That's right. Um, yeah, the truth comes out. Yeah. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed this first uh, this first go out open mic. It, the, the whole point is to just be open freestyle and talk about things that we hear every day. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.